What is up everyone? Welcome here to another episode on the podcast of Inner Path Seekers. I'm Yelis Vaas, your host, and I'm also the founder of the IPS project, uh, which, you know, stands for Inner Path Seekers. I created this project some years ago um, because I found there to be a severe lack of education on life topics. I mean, you don't learn anything about it in school, even though it can drastically improve your life if you learn more about mental health, the mind, relationships, the body and brain. Yeah, it can drastically improve your life. Uh, it certainly did for me. And therefore, I went out to create this project, this platform providing uh, yeah, education on those topics. And one way is through this podcast. And today, I had none other than Derek Sivers on the show. Um, Derek is actually someone that I looked up to for years. I see him as a, a role model who has given me a lot of lessons and insights and ideas. So it was quite, I mean, I'm still stunned that I did this interview with him and yeah, that Derek said yes to come on the show. Now, who is Derek Sivers if you've never heard of him? Um, in one sentence, I would say that Derek Sivers is a multi-talented creator and a critical thinker. Now, I will give a, a bit more of an extensive bio so you uh, will know a bit more who he is before we dive into the interview. At the age of 14, Derek committed to becoming a successful musician. And for the next 15 years, until he was 29, um, he yeah lived a full time or, or he made a full time income from being a musician. Now, at the age of 29, Derek accidentally created a business called CD Baby. So we're in 1997 now. Uh, so Derek created CD Baby initially as a solution to sell his own music online. Now, it quickly grow into the largest online distributor of independent music, helping thousands of independent musicians reach a global audience. CD Baby became a significant player in the music industry and particularly for independent artists who previously had limited distribution channels. After running CD Baby for 10 years, Derek decided to sell his company and sold it for 22 million dollars in 2008. Now what's interesting is that he actually gave all that money away, so the 22 million dollars to charity uh, for music education. And that's already a little bit of the uh, of a glimpse into the mind of Derek Sivers that you uh, yeah, will soon be exposed to way more. Now today Derek spends his time writing, coding, and working on various other projects that sparks his interest. If you're actually curious to, you know, read what he is currently doing and working on, you can check his What I'm Doing Now page by going to sif.rs slash now. So S-I-V-E dot R-S slash now uh, page. And that's where you can read more in depth. Uh, yeah, the things that he's working on and doing right now. Now, just to add, Derek has done TED Talks. He has done several TED Talks. Uh, he has also written several books. In total, he has written five books, with his latest book being called Useful Not True. Uh, this released just a couple of weeks ago. I've read it. I really, really liked it. Uh, you can find those. Uh, and by the way, we will, of course, talk about his latest book, Useful Not True, throughout the interview. Um, but you can find his TED Talks, his books, and any other resources that Derek mentions throughout the interview, as there's quite a lot, uh, in the show notes, in the resource tab. And you can find the show notes located in the description of this episode, or you can also go directly to the ipsproject.com slash podcasts and search for Derek to find them. Now with that, I'm not going to make this intro any longer anymore. So let's jump into this very uh, diverse and interesting interview with the one and only Derek Sivers. Derek, a warm welcome here to the podcast. This is, I mean, honestly amazing for me to have you on the show. Thanks, Yelis. Yeah, we've been emailing about this for a long time, so I'm glad it yes, finally happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah me too. Uh, so I have, um, uh, well, uh, hopefully a delicious uh, meal or a couple of meals uh, prepared for you during this interview. Uh, you know, I've 
create quite a diverse interview with different questions. So there will be some yeah, different tastes in the meals. And uh, to start maybe uh, with the appetizer, uh, by talking first and foremost about your latest book, Useful, Not True. I've uh, listened to the audio version, which I always love. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it's I like it. Um, let me ask a question about the book. So it's probably a question that you have been asked quite often, but I think it might be very helpful uh, for people uh, right now listening who are not familiar with the book. If you could just give an example of what is something that is useful but not true that you've come to realize after writing the book or during uh, when you are when you were writing the book. Ooh. Well, since you call this the appetizer, let's mm -hmm. start easy. For sure. anybody listening, uh, I'll use an example that we all know, which is if you are driving in traffic, for example, and somebody else on the road is driving like an idiot and being dangerous and being reckless and speeding and, and weaving in between cars, and your first thought is, what a jerk, what an asshole. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then we've heard that it can be wise to think, wait, maybe that person is driving a sick child to the hospital. Maybe they have their, their dying mother in the back seat. And that thought makes you go, <sighs> it makes you relax. It makes you remember that other people have problems, that it's not all about you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That said, it's probably not true, <laughs> but it's very useful to think that way because it made you relax, it made you more empathetic. Trying to argue whether that's true or not is not the point. The real point was the effect that that thought had on you. So that's an example that we've all heard of. But now you can extrapolate that to other aspects in life. You can believe that, uh, say, if you get invited to an event and you're feeling social anxiety, you could believe that everybody in that event is waiting for you to break the ice, that they also are nervous and they want to connect with people, which is why they came, but they're right. all too scared to be the first one to say something. So they need you to break the ice. And so if you believe that, you'll walk into the event and feel that it's almost like your responsibility or your duty to to be the one to walk up to a stranger and say, Hi, I'm Yellis. What do you do? Um, now, that, not, that may not be true. They might not want to meet you. But believing that made you more open or more social, you know, this belief that every stranger is a potential friend. Somebody else could argue against that and say, Well, Yellis, that's not true. You say, I don't care if it's true or not. It's useful. It's useful for me to believe this because it makes me take good actions. And so that's then to really answer your question. That was the main thing I learned while writing this book is that the whole point of beliefs are the actions that they create. The only purpose of beliefs is the actions they create. There's really no other reason for them. Even religious beliefs, philosophical beliefs, moral beliefs, the whole point of all of them is to change your actions. That's it. How, I mean, because as the reader, when you read a book like uh, yours, Useful Not True, for example, uh, you step on this journey, right? Um, that the writer kind of created for you where you will grow and learn. How for you as the writer though, I mean, besides what you just shared, maybe now has this book changed you? Mm. It was this particular book was a learning experience for me. It's my fifth book. And my previous four books, I was speaking about things I already knew about. This was the first time that I set out two years ago to write a book about something that I didn't know about yet. I knew a little bit. Of, I knew that I had a tendency to choose beliefs because they were useful to me, not because they're true. But I didn't look into it deeper than that. So two years ago, I decided this is an interesting subject. I'm going to write a book about this. 
and I contacted philosophy professors that steered me in the direction of pragmatism and nihilism and existentialism and skepticism. And I read uh, a lot of books about religion and about beliefs. And I just spent two years diving into this subject of why we choose beliefs. So I learned a lot through that process. Wow. Is there anything that particularly triggered you to want to write? I mean, because writing a book takes a lot of time to spend so much time on that topic. Yeah, it was underlying everything else I had been saying for years. For years, even if I was writing about business, and I'd say, business is a place to be generous. <laughs> Generosity is the whole point of business. And somebody, every now and then somebody would come and push back and say, hey, that's not true. <laughs> business is about mm. profit. I'd say, I don't care if it's true or not. I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying that for me to believe this is useful. And then, so then I had to question, well, what do I mean useful? And that's why I eventually came to the conclusion, oh, useful means it helps you take the actions. It helps you be who you want to be, do what you need to do, or feel at peace. Uh, feel at peace was a, a one that took a while to realize because like the first example of driving in traffic with a, a jerk, <laughs> Uh, the action you want to take is not necessarily motion. It can be an internal, you know, <sighs> makes me feel better. And that's a lot of the ones that we deal with the past. For example, a lot of people have the belief that everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's a very yeah. common belief in many cultures around the world. People say everything happens for a reason and they say it like it's a true fact, but it's not. It's a belief that you choose uh, or that somebody's told you and you adopt that belief because you like the way it makes you feel. It helps you think of the troubling things in your past that might be upsetting and it makes you go, ah, well, I just have to trust it all happens for a reason. And that belief makes you feel better. So, Yeah, yeah. It's a story that helps you uh, navigate through the chaos that life is right yeah um yeah is there actually anything that you think of right now um that you when writing the book something that you really thought was really well thought out a concept or an idea that you re really liked but that you in the end did not put in the book oh that you feel Fun could question. be interesting to share with me and the listener? Yeah, I'll tell you a couple. Uh, I removed more than I kept in the book. The The folder of the final book, the words in the final book, is smaller than the folder containing all the yeah. things I took <laughs> out of it. So, yeah, there were a few good ones. I had a cute little story about... Uh, two aliens that are observing Earth right now. They're in a little spaceship uh, in orbit, observing Earth through two instruments, uh, like two telescopes. One can see everything we do. The other can hear all of our thoughts. But they're two different instruments, and they're two different aliens sitting next to each other at these two different instruments, and they only know how to work one of them, right? So one of them can only hear all of our thoughts. The only ones can, the other one can only see everything we do. And so they coordinate. And so, um, so the one that can hear all of our thoughts is kind of scanning and observing Earth. And at one point, uh, he hears uh, a human that's under attack, that's being attacked by 10 people viciously and cruelly. Uh, attacking with just nothing but but vengeance and cruel intentions, and uh, and so he quickly gives the coordinates to the other one that can see everything, saying, "Here, here, here! Look, go to these coordinates. What's going on there? I'm listening to this attack." And the other alien looks and just sees a person sitting by themselves in their home, just looking sad. And they're confused, and they double check the coordinates. They verify, yeah, that's their wow. And so this person isn't actually physically under attack, 
but just feels under, like in this person's head, they're experiencing an attack that's not physically happening. Uh, and I had a couple more examples like that. But in the end, the other examples didn't quite stand up. I feel like I could have probably worked for a few more weeks on that and made it a keeper in the book. But instead, I had to come to the conclusion that the book is not the final say. <laughs> that the book uh, introduces the subject and brings it up to say, hey, this is an interesting thing to think about. Let's think about this. But I don't have to make the book be like the final answer to everything. So I decided uh, that the conversation would continue on the website for free in the open. And that's why the end of the book says, you know, this this is not the end. Go to the website. Uh, there will be more stories post posted, more beliefs that readers can share, beliefs that they find to be useful, not true, uh, and things like that. It was a nice reminder that the book doesn't have to be the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. I think that must be quite hard, actually, to filter out, you know, a book <laughs> and know, like, okay, that's for the book. I will just cut that out, maybe use it somewhere else yeah. like you do. That's it's, a hard process. Luckily, <laughs> I there's some people that want to write a big, conclusive book. Well, let's say Tim Ferriss, for example. Yeah. Uh, his books are big, <laughs> and they try to include everything there is to say on this subject. I, I think he mm. gets inspired and driven by having a book that is the ultimate book on you know, the four hour work week or mastering your health or something like that. And so he's almost tormented and driven to make it the best. It can be the most comprehensive, conclusive book on the subject. And a lot of people are driven by that urge. Uh, I'm thankful that I am not driven by that, but rather uh, I like short books. I think short books are very useful to other people. They're very easy to give to a friend. Uh, you don't want to give a 900-page book to a friend and say, here, read this. <laughs> it's like a curse. <laughs> but yeah, if you give yeah, a little 95-page yeah. book to a friend that they can read in an hour or so, that's mm. a nice gift. Uh, and a nice gift to yourself. It's less of a slog and more of a treat. So, um, so luckily, as I'm editing, I ruthlessly chop because I'm actually trying to make the shortest book I can. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you open the journey for the people, you know, to continue on by themselves. Uh, yeah. If it's a short book and having it open the journey that yeah sets them on their way. That's kind of, yeah, it's nice. Um, for me, when, I mean, I read a couple of your books and the main feeling that I have always gained or felt from them while, while I read them was this feeling of freedom. Um, probably because you opened my mind to new ideas, new insights, new ways of looking at things, questioning things. Is there for yourself a main thread that you can see running through each book that you've re uh, written that you kind of want to, or that you hope readers will gain from them? Hmm. That's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm always asking myself, what's another way to look at this? And I try to not put out something into the world unless it's an angle or a perspective that either hasn't been considered, hasn't been talked about publicly or mm -hmm. uh, is underrepresented in the conversation. So I try to bring up an alternate point of view that most people are not considering. So that's that was the point of my last book called How to Live that had 27 conflicting answers yeah, yeah, like to that, that question of how should I live my life. And the whole point was to make you realize that no one way is the answer, that each one can be useful for a purpose. Uh, each one could work. You could live your life by any one of these, 
or none of them or combine them. So anytime somebody's telling you that, uh, you know, Yellis, this is the answer, this is how to live, that you should take it very lightly <laughs> because it's never the only answer. Yeah, see, that's what I said. Like, y your books are very, fr very freeing to me to read. Thank you. And that's the mission accomplished. That I get from them, so. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, like I said in the beginning, I've got quite a diverse interview uh, prepared for you. So let me serve you uh, another meal here. Uh, let's play a game. It's not a complicated game. You might have played it before. It's called Overrated, Underrated. And uh, just to explain the not complicated rules, but so everyone is on board. I'm going to say a word to you, um, you know, and I kind of selected some words or concepts out that I thought you had something interesting to, to share on. Uh, and you can reply by saying if you feel that's overrated or underrated. And then also if you could elaborate why that would be great sure okay. by the way i love that you're right, doing well, this no i have never yeah. <laughs> played this although it oh. is a, one of mm. my favorite podcasts is called conversations with tyler and he often plays overrated or underrated on that podcast so uh, i've heard it many times but i have never played right. it lay it on me all right cool cool <laughs> all right let's start with luck Overrated, overrated or underrated? Uh, hugely overrated. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I elaborate on that? <laughs> um, I, uh, you answer I'll just tell a quick little that. story. <laughs> Let me just tell, yeah, I'll just tell a quick story to say why I think this is perhaps overrated. Is I used to believe it was... God, actually, you know what? I could argue both ways. I, I generally believe it's underrated that people attribute to skill what is often just luck. Uh, and so when a friend of mine set, called me a successful entrepreneur, no, no, he called me uh, a great entrepreneur. And I said, no, 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 no. I am not a great entrepreneur. Uh, I am just lucky. And he said, bullshit, that's not, what you did was not luck. I said, bullshit, yes, it was. <laughs> and he said, uh, no, man, I don't believe in luck. I said, how can you not believe in luck? I said, look, you were lucky to be born in America, in a prosperous country. And he said, great example. He said, that wasn't luck. He said, my great-grandparents came over from Russia like three generations ago. They knew nobody in America. They didn't speak the language, but they believed that if they endured the hardship in their life, that their kids would have a better life and their grandkids would have an even better life. And he said they invested the hard work and misery to make the future generations happier. That was not luck. I went, ooh, good point. Um, so now I often think in terms of the things we do that might even seem like luck, but actually are the culmination of many micro decisions mm -hmm. so luck for you is overrated <laughs> i'm gonna argue both sides of this one uh let, let's say um for now i'll pick an overrated sure okay all right all right okay um the next one that i have is uh, one that might not surprise you Money, overrated or underrated? <sighs> Sorry, the, my real answer is in some circles, let's say in many circles, money is very overrated. Money's never the point. It's a means to something else. It's just a neutral trait of value. It's not that uh important um it's uh a lot of people are chasing more and more and more money when in fact they really should just spend a little more time looking inward going wait why what do i really want uh and go directly for what you really want instead of trying to get the money that's just supposed to be the neutral trade of value to get you what you really want just go directly for what you really want that said in some circles like especially a lot of my old musician friends, money can be 
underrated because it seems to be the opposite of art. And so they say, man, money doesn't matter. Don't right. worry about money. But by saying that, they're being very unwise because the rest of their life becomes very hard because they've dismissed money, which is supposed to be this neutral trait of value, by not putting any attention into making money. It's like they're not putting any attention into being valuable. And I think that can be a disservice. So, yeah, it depends which community you're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you say a few times um, that you don't work for money. I Never think have. that might confuse some people right now listening, thinking like, what do you mean you don't work for work money? Of course you work for money. What do you mean with that, with that actually? Money's always the side effect. Money's never the point. If you're doing something only for the money, yeah. Um, well, let's just say you should aim to never do something only for the money. There should always be another benefit in it for you. Uh, something you're learning by doing this, making more connections, building your expertise, um, mm -hmm. focusing on that, the, the learning, the building the expertise, the making new connections. That's the real point. And yes, money also comes as a side effect. But if you lose your values, or let's say if you're valuing money as the point itself, to me that's like saying that the point of having a car is to make the odometer go up. And then you get people doing stupid things like uh, propping their car up overnight on a thing and, and making a machine spin the wheels so that when they wake up in the morning, the odometer is higher. And now you've made the numbers go, go up, but for no benefit for anyone. And I think that's what a lot of people, unfortunately, lose their way and start doing with money is money's supposed to be uh, a side effect of doing what you want uh, or what excites you. But if they focus on the money itself, then it's like you're just spinning your odometer wheels or spinning the wheels to make the odometer go up. It's not the point. So... Um... Yeah, so I've never worked yeah. for money. Is there maybe something, I don't know, some insights to anyone listening who might be mainly chasing money? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, just, or, you know, ease out of it. Ask yourself... Because I could... Yeah, what you want to be doing. Go ahead. Sorry, um... I could imagine some people who grew up poor, uh, who started earning a lot of money because of some business that they created, feel a lot of satisfaction from that and continue just growing and growing more money. Okay. If, if that actually works for them, if that's actually all they want out of life, well, wow, that's uh, mm. <laughs> lucky you. If that's all you care about in life is, the, is digits. Um, mm -hmm. what a simple life <laughs> what a sad and simple life <laughs> uh, by the way personally Wait, I, I so told hold on. I, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 sorry I, I should kind of elaborate just a tiny bit more on this of course I know friends in situations where you have no money at all you have to do something just for the money and so you could look at that and say oh you privileged asshole <laughs> You know, I have to work for money. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you can take any situation, even when you're doing something just for the money, you can turn it into a learning situation. You know, even if you're just working in a warehouse, moving packages from left to right, you can turn it into a learning situation and learn the systems and learn how the warehouse works and do things so that you could use this learning to advance yourself in life instead of yeah. doing it just for the money. So I should mm. actually, I've never actually written about this. I should clarify it more if I do. Uh, because what I'm saying is, what I'm not saying is don't do any work because it pays. But I'm saying that any situation you're in, you can make it about much more than just the money. Yeah. I think this comes down to deep happiness instead of like a short-term happiness, right? Getting some money, your next paycheck or 
well, yeah, um, yeah, can help to get some short term happiness, but that's not long term happiness. Uh, there has well to put. be something deeper, like learning a skill or doing something meaningful or yeah, helping or serving people. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, if you want to experience that, go for that. <laughs> okay, um, role models slash mentors overrated underrated well role models maybe underrated mentors definitely overrated overrated if you think that it has to be a real person that knows you very well and works with you and guides you telling you what to do seeking that is like seeking a spouse and a professor in the same person for somebody to really commit to you and get to know you that well and also have this magical wisdom that you think that they know better than you but they know you very well that's really hard to find i know some people have found that i don't know if i ever have so instead you've probably seen i wrote a little article that I'm kind of proud of uh, about how to contact your mentors. So the, the URL is sive.rs slash M-E-N-T, the first four letters of mentor. So if you go to that article, show notes. thank you. You'll see my take on how to ask your mentors for help. Okay. And, and role models you said rather underrated. Well, maybe that's the gist of my recommendation is instead of looking for mentors, look for role models where you can get to know somebody's thinking style and imagine what they would say instead of needing that person themselves to tell you what to do. You can just get to know all of their public writing and speaking and just imagine what that person would say. And that can be as or more useful and definitely more considerate than insisting that that person themselves stop what they're doing to give you their full attention for many hours. Do you feel, and I think you said it already a bit, that you can only have real role models or mentors uh, in person instead of online? Or can they also be online? Well, I'm actually highly recommending they be in your head. <laughs> so... Yeah, they could also be online. But what I'm saying is don't even insist that you need to get uh, Bill Gates to email you perfectly, you know, personally to tell you what to do. I'm just saying you could just imagine to yourself, uh, what would Bill Gates do? Uh, but this goes at any level, even if it's a, a, a podcaster, even if, if it's somebody that listens to your show a lot saying, Yellis, I need your help. What should I do? It's like, well... Come on, you've listened to all of my podcasts. I think you can imagine what I would yeah, say. Yeah. And you imagining yeah. what I would say is actually much more efficient for both of us. Uh, and ultimately <laughs> gives you a sense of pride that that solution came from you. Uh, it, it would mean more if you asking yourself, what would Yellis say? Uh, sorry, I'm saying you to somebody in the audience right now. If you, you're asking yourself, what would Yellis say? Ultimately, that's more useful to you than insisting that Yellis himself tell you what to do. Yeah. You're actively thinking about what to do, right? Which is more powerful. And also with every free. single little idea, you get to say if you think of like 10 things. Sorry, I'm just going to keep picking on you. <laughs> if if you audience were to think of 10 things that Yellis would tell you to do and say eight of those 10 make you right away go, oh, no, not that. Uh, no, not that. But then one of them makes you go, ooh, that's a good idea. And then one of them makes you go, ooh, that's a great idea. In fact, I want to take action on that right away. Well, there, now you've had a quick feedback loop between your mm. giant hairball of internal <laughs> uh, factors <laughs> mm -hmm. now bringing in uh, Yellis's influence of what you think he would say. That's a much faster processing loop than trying to get 
yell us on the phone or meet up for coffee in person in Belgium. Uh, <laughs> by the way, where in Belgium are you? Um, right now, I am in my hometown, so it's a tiny town, but mostly I'm in Antwerp. Okay. You know cool. the you know Antwerp. It's course, it's, yeah. uh, it's basically yeah, yeah the Flemish city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I lived in for a little while. I was a legal resident of Belgium, and I lived in Place Flaget in Ixel, Brussels. Uh, and, oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, so I, Brussels is uh, is ugly, but it's the peg that holds the two halves <laughs> together. But um, Yes. Yeah. But my favorite, <laughs> you know, Bruges is gorgeous, but my favorite mm-hmm. city in uh, Belgium was, was Ghent because it was that nice balance of, like, the beauty of Bruges, but yet this kind of lively student scene it just kind of had a creative vibrancy to it but yet like perfect small so i really yeah. like ghent i would love to live in ghent yeah yeah well if you're ever moving to ghent let me know <laughs> i will um yeah <laughs> sorry yeah i'll do ghent uh, underrated there you go okay i'll just add one to the, <laughs> the quiz totally underrated uh let me ask a last one um i got a few more for a bit later in the interview uh but the last one for now passion Overrated, <laughs> underrated. Way overrated. Uh, mm-hmm. I love the take on it from Cal Newport's book called So Good They Can't Ignore You, where he yes. deep dove into the subject and came to the conclusion that passion is what we call the excitement that we get from a field of our expertise, but it tends to come after it's our expertise that first we get to know something and get good at it. And then it starts this feedback loop of uh, getting more interesting, doing better work. And because you're doing better work, you get more rewarded. And then you start to meet more interesting people in the field because you're getting better at this. And then it turns into a passion. The common problem people make is sitting at home saying, I need to find my passion. (laughs) Yeah, mm-hmm. as if just sitting there and thinking for a long time will suddenly find a lightning bolt to shoot through their veins and charge them full of passion. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think you just start doing whatever you can. Um, and then as you build expertise, your passion for that subject will grow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> thinking, out, why were you in Brussels, actually? <laughs> Real answer, I will yeah. admit now, 10 years later, I was just trying to get a passport for my kid. I want, yeah, <sighs> present tense, I'll still say that. I want my kid to have an EU passport. I think it would increase his options in life. Brussels or Belgium was, at least 10 years ago, a pretty quick path to becoming a legal resident first. If you just incorporate a company in Belgium, then they will make you a legal resident. And then if you you have to hire a couple people and have a real company where you're increasing the local economy and providing a couple jobs. But if you do that for a number of years to keep your resident status active, they will, uh, you can apply for citizenship after just a few years and probably get it. That's what I was trying to do. Uh, but then unfortunately, my immigration lawyer forgot to tell me to file one form and poof, uh, a couple years of work and maybe a hundred thousand euros all disappeared. Um, oh, no. which was really kind of sad at the time, but that was 10 years ago and I'm over it, but that's what I was doing. Yeah. Ah, I wonder if it's still the easiest country in, U- in Europe to, to become. There are always citizen. easier ways. I think it's like, if you really wanted to run a company anyway, that needed a couple employees with a physical office in Belgium, it's a good path. Um, if you have savings that you could invest, then Portugal had a thing called the Golden Visa where you could just yes. buy an investment property, and uh, well, that was quite easy. Uh, if you have way too much money and you don't mind just throwing away a million euro, you can uh, contact Malta, and Malta will mm. make you a pretty instant citizen if you want to just give yeah. them a million euro. Uh, there are ways. <laughs> it depends what you consider yeah, yeah. To be easy. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it fun is. subject I nerd out about. Of course, I just I learned about it because I wanted my boy to have an EU passport just to increase his options in life. It was just rational. Wow. Okay. Cool. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> just uh, maybe yeah, a bit off track uh, now. but Totally uh, off just, track, uh, but that's curious. what we're doing here. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, totally off track. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I have a, a personal question for you that I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. So now is my chance. <laughs> um, now, I will say, of course, I think this is a question that uh, not alone, in a way, will help me, but I think it's quite a common one. Uh, yeah. Our feelings are not so unusual <laughs> you know um so it, this is something that i used to struggle with way more in the past uh, way less now but i will say that it can sometimes still bite at me so i don't have a you know nine to five job uh most of my life basically when i was like 23 i started on this path of just being self-employed and doing my own thing um and I've had people in my hometown, um, my grandpa uh, or other people that I've heard of, call me uh, weird <laughs> for doing what I do. Uh, now, I could imagine that there are quite a lot of people that are held back because they're afraid of internal or external judgments of being called weird because as humans, we're social creatures, right? So... Yeah, um, it really hurts actually when someone calls you weird and in a way casts you out of their circle. And my question is, I could imagine, <laughs> uh, this is an assumption, that there might have been people in your life who might have said it directly or indirectly to you as well, that what you do or what you do in life is weird. Have you always, if people have said that to you, being okay with it, with just dealing with that? Um, if yes, can you see why? If no, how have you gone, become better at that? And maybe uh, last, I'm making the question now super long, but if there's anyone listening right now who might be held back be from that internal or external judgment of doing something that they want to do, do you have any suggestions or insights to them? <laughs> okay. Fun subject. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. try to be succinct. Otherwise, I could talk about this thing for hours. Mm -hmm. First, I have to say, you have to know yourself enough to know whether you want to walk the weird path or not. Some of us do. Some of us don't. Uh, one of my best friends does not. Uh, she moved from Korea to the U.S. when she was nine years old. And all she's ever wanted to do is to fit in. She felt like such an outcast at nine that she just decided at nine years old, like, I'm going to fit in. <laughs> and that's all she's wanted in her life. And she's one of my best friends. So following the path of not being weird is not wrong. Uh, you have to just decide for yourself whether uh, that's what you want. Often these can be norms Sorry, often norms can be good guidelines. When in doubt, follow the norms. It's the the well-proven path to a good life is to follow the suggestions, whether it's your religion or your community morals or just what your parents say. Uh, doing what a lot of people suggest can be a good recipe. But for some of us... <laughs> It can be the <laughs> anti-recipe. Uh, I look at most normal people and think, ugh, <laughs> that is the opposite of what I want. <laughs> I don't want that life. If you want to put me on the shrink's couch for a minute to ask why I'm this way, it might just be DNA, but it might be the fact that when I was age two to six, my family moved around a lot. So everywhere I lived, I felt I'm not from here. I'm not one of you people because we moved to different countries too. So wherever I went, people would say, you know, you're weird. You're not, you're not like us. I'd say, yeah, I'm not one of you people. Your norms don't apply to me. I'm not from here. And then we'd move to somewhere else. And I'd say, well, I'm not from here either. And then we moved to Chicago when I was six. And I said, well, I'm not from here, but that's where we ended up staying. But I just kept that feeling with me the whole time. 
I'm not from here. Your norms don't apply to me. It's like if you were to suddenly go to Sri Lanka right now, assuming yep. you're not from Sri Lanka, <laughs> that <No. laughs> the the community and society's norms in Sri Lanka wouldn't apply to you. You're an outsider. So I just feel like that everywhere. I feel that no matter what group of people I'm in, this is not my culture. Their norms don't apply to me. Anything they say I should be or should be doing uh, doesn't apply to me because I'm not from here. So that's my take on it. And I taught my kid early on, like starting when he was, I don't know, four, <laughs> that weird is a compliment. When somebody says weird, if somebody says you're weird, that's a great compliment. You should say thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, just, I just instilled that to him earlier. I said, because it means that you are not just doing what everybody else is doing, that you're creative and surprising, that you're looking at through things through your own formula, not just adopting theirs. I said, yeah, weird is a great compliment. So it can just be easily reframed. And you could choose to reframe that for yourself if mm. you want to walk that weird path in life. Yeah, because unfortunately, in general, you don't call someone weird. You know, it, it's not it's not meant as a compliment. It's mostly meant as something negative. Uh, so it should have some maybe rebranding or, uh, yeah. <laughs> is that what you wanted to say? or? Yeah, that it's... <laughs> There is there's a TV show called Rick and Morty, a ah, cartoon <laughs> show that I watched. Okay, so there was a line that people often quote from that, whereas I think he's performing in front of an audience, some and everybody goes boo, and he says something like, "Your boos mean nothing to me because I've seen what makes you cheer." <laughs> it's like I, you know, the, or that's the the idea that it's like if you disapprove of my actions. I'm going to take that as a sign that I'm doing the right thing. Mm. Mm. For someone listening who, you know, is afraid of being called weird, but yeah, and is held back from pursuing what they actually want to do. Is there something that you would say to them still? Um, I still wrestle with that myself, even though I have proudly embraced the weird path for my whole life, and I'm 54 now, uh -huh. uh, I still have to catch myself. Uh, and even more wholeheartedly embrace doing things the way that I want to do, even if most people I know are against it. And one example is um, a lot of my ex-girlfriends have been upset that I really love working. And I don't mean, I mean, you know, my definition of work is not like I'm just not, not just trying to make money here, but uh, d doing what I love. I, I wake up at five in the morning excited about the book I'm writing or excited about a program I'm working on, a co uh, programming, coding, um, or excited about a book I'm reading. And I stay excited about what I'm doing from 5 a.m. to midnight, you know? And yeah. I don't want to sit around watching TV. I don't want to just sit on couches wasting my life away. I love my work. I love... And I say my work, but it's like my life's work. It's like doing what I love best. I'm really excited about life. I don't want to just sit there and stare at screens. And this has been very, very disappointing to a lot of my exes that might seem exciting and interesting at first, but ultimately just want to sit around for a third of their life staring at a screen. Yeah. And I would just say, no, I won't do that. I won't mm. just sit on a couch and stare at a screen, even with you. Like, sorry, I value my life and my brain and my thoughts and my interests too much. And so I, I find that I'm still constantly having to re-support that decision internally. Mm. And uh, you, you still struggle with that, with this 
taking this bet of being weird or yeah well that i just give you one example of not wanting to watch tv (laughs) yeah um Uh By the way, it's one of the few things I know how to say in Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> I don't want to watch TV now. Um, anyway, uh, uh, how coincidental that that just came up in conversation then. Uh, but it comes up with things like my technology choices. I like ultra simplicity when it comes to programming and tech. Um, not quite retro because I'm not nostalgic but I dismiss unnecessary complexities that people choose because they're hoping to get a job at Google or Facebook or something when you need giant complex technologies. But I'm just running a little personal website on a $5 a month web server. I like to constantly make things as simple as possible, even if it's more work up front. Uh, Uh And I find that I'm having to constantly defend those kind of choices. So yeah, point is I do still have to catch like catch myself um no not catch myself i have to strengthen my logic to explain why i'm doing what i'm doing and maybe that's the 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 eventual answer to your question which is i think even if you have a grandpa telling you you're weird <laughs> and you care about your grandpa a lot You just have to put in more time to logically explain to somebody who has a different value system why this choice makes sense for you. I'll give one more example. Somebody just asked me a week ago why I gave away uh, all my money and why I don't want any more money. And I said, uh, sorry, I didn't give away all my money. I I basically just refuse new money coming in. Uh, I say, I've got enough. And he said, that's very unusual. That's very, why are you so weird, <laughs> essentially? And I said, look, it's it's as if I had 1,000 cans of beans in my basement. I have beans for life. <laughs> I don't need any more beans. And so if you show up at my door saying, hey, I've got a shipment of 2,000 more cans of beans, I'll say, mm-hmm. please don't give those to me. Just there are plenty of people in the world that need beans. Send I don't them to need Belgium. any more beans. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> send them to Belgium. I've got plenty of beans. Please, it just I don't want any more. Mm-hmm. And somehow, when I said that, uh, the guy went, "Wow, that was very rationally explained." He said, "You're not being altruistic. It's just a logical choice." I said, "Yes, it's just a logical, rational yeah, yeah. choice." So there's probably a way that if somebody's saying that your life decisions are weird in a critical way, you might just want to put in a little more time to think of how to explain it in a rational way to a stranger. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt the conversation for just a short moment. If you want to uh, spend more one-on-one time learning from guests that have been here on the show, then check out the IPS Academy as that's where I've created together with guests that have been again here on the show, uh, online courses covering the topics that you don't learn in school. You know, that's really what the IPS project is about to offer those that education, life education. So we have a, a, a an archive of online courses already uh, covering the topics of mental health, relationships, the body and brain, the mind. And uh, yeah, in the description, you can find a link to the IPS Academy. You can also go directly to the ipsproject.com slash academy to find the same page. Uh, We're currently working on more really exciting courses that I can't wait to release in the nearby future. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. Uh, There's preview lessons. uh, There's reviews from other students so you can have an idea and a feeling what the course is about and if you will like it or not. Go again directly uh, to the ipsproject.com slash academy or check the description to find the same link to that page. All right, let's return back now to the interview with Derek Sivers. This next question builds a little bit further on that previous question. You strike me as someone who's really fluid 
in their identity. Like you don't hold on to something that used to be something, um, you know, a part of you. Uh, you don't hold on to that forever. And correct me if I'm wrong with anything that I'm saying. Yeah, my, right? my gender it's stays just... pretty constant. The other thing. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I would say that that's very hard for for quite some people. I think people, many people hold on to you know something being a part of them, and they even if it doesn't make sense anymore, ten years later they still hold on to it. But you seem to be very good at letting that go. Um, have you always been good at that in life? And why do you feel it's important to be fluid in life uh, and not hold on to your identity so much? Okay, well, first, kind of like the weird question, I'll say that I'm not recommending that everybody needs to be more fluid. A lot of people get a lot of deep happiness from saying, this is who I am, this is where I live, this is what I do, this is what I value, that's that. And that makes them really happy. And in fact, it can make them really productive and effective and flourishing because it's almost like a solid foundation. Uh, no earthquakes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then they can flourish up at the higher levels because the foundation is solid. So please don't think that I'm saying that everybody should be so fluid and live on a marsh. But... It doesn't come naturally to me, or maybe I should say it didn't, to challenge the deeper set stuff. But because I value personal growth so much, when I would catch myself feeling really attached to a certain identity, like I am a musician, I can't do something that's not music because I'm a musician yeah, yeah. and that's that. And I would catch exactly. myself saying or thinking that and go, whoa, hold on. Really? Is that really like all I am? Like, I can't do anything else because this is what I am. And so I'd stop and deliberately challenge that. And ch when I say challenge, I mean through actions. I would try to disprove that. I'd say, well, let's see what it feels like to actively pursue something interesting that is not music because I feel that I can't do anything else. Let me try to disprove that. Um, selling my company was like that. When I started mm -hmm. CD Baby in 1997, mm -hmm. 98, I felt that I was going to do this thing forever. I felt this is it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this for my whole life. And then 10 years later, I was really feeling done. I was just over it. I felt I had said everything I had to say, done everything I wanted to do. But that was really messing with my identity because I had decided early on I'm doing this thing for life. And right. so once again, I had to challenge, go, wait, really? <laughs> am I am I really a, a going to a block per, the personal growth that would come from doing something new? I went, oh, okay, maybe, maybe let me, I'm going to sell the company because I don't want to. <laughs> it's because I feel that I can't. Now I must in order to challenge that limiting belief. Even if it's the wrong answer, it will guide me towards more personal growth. I could have made more money by staying, but I had to personally challenge myself to, to grow my self-identity to be somebody that would leave the thing I thought I would never leave. Yeah. And then I still do that. Personal growth. Yeah. Right. Even, I mean, again, I, earlier I mentioned a programming language or programming I still, I really enjoy computer programming and I caught myself feeling like, well, this is the way I do things. I use Ruby. I use PostgreSQL. That's me. And I go, wait, hold on. <laughs> Why am I so stuck on those two things? Um, I just, uh, 10 days ago, erased my computer and reinstalled a new operating system on it that I had never used before. And yeah. that was a fun challenge because I felt like, well, I use OpenBSD. That's my operating system. It's like, hmm, I'm pretty stuck on that, aren't I? All right, well, let me challenge that. Let me try this version of Linux called Void Linux. So wiped my hard drive, installed from scratch, pulled my files back over, and I'm loving it lately. 
So it's like, all right, I just expanded my self-definition a little bit. I am now a guy who uses OpenBSD and Void Linux, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's minute, yeah. but I think you can relate. We can all relate to our own version. There are these ways of doing things that we get stuck on. And it's, I think it's healthy to challenge yourself to get unstuck from your preferences. The people that you've met in your life, right, maybe to um, use them, would you say most have trouble with being fluid in life and attaching too much to things being a part of their identity? I think most people don't care about this subject as much as I do. <laughs> I think, I think it's a particular interest of mine. I think I nerd out on the subject of self expansion, expansion of self identity. So most people I know, whether it's acquaintances or even my best friends are really just more interested in doing good work, finding a romantic partner, uh being happy just that kind of stuff i'm i'm their friend that nerds out on the subject of expanding my self identity <laughs> um because the reason why i said that this question builds a little bit on the previous one is because the previous one you know what's what can stop people often is you know this fear of internal or external judgments but i also think here what can stop people from actually pursuing what they really want to do is that they're stuck with an identity that's not serving them anymore. Right. Yeah, the there are plenty of role models, if you want them, uh, in the music world where musicians like Bob Dylan, Madonna, yeah. uh, Paul Simon, mm. David Bowie would... Mm constantly reinvent themselves and change their musical genre. Miles Davis did this great. Um, change their musical genre. And every time they did, fans of their previous genre would get upset. And they'd say, that's okay. I know a lot of you will be upset by this, but I need to keep learning and growing and trying new things. I need to keep trying different musical styles. I need to never get stuck in a rut. I mean, you know, even painters... Uh, that have changed their style over the years, like Picasso, uh, most drastically. Um, I see it as kind of the artistic challenge to yourself to uh, keep moving on past your expertise. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, that's a good line. I got to remember that. I like that a lot. Keep moving <laughs> on past your expertise. Mm. I I love doing interviews yeah. like this where... Every now and then, when you challenge me with a question that I haven't considered before, and I kind of hear like improvising on the spot, it's really fun for me because I also have to be succinct and not boring because I know people are tuning in <laughs> for a limited time. They don't have an unlimited attention. So I need to think of how to say this thing and communicate it well from my head, but also in an accurate and succinct way and that's a fun challenge and every now and then it's really rewarding for me to uh come up with an idea i hadn't before so thanks for that cool well yeah awesome uh that's yeah that's awesome to hear um let me give or throw a few last overrated underrated questions and yeah at you great. and then i have one final end question the dessert uh for you so Responsibility, overrated, underrated. Overrated. Mm -hmm. Let's put it in the category of useful, not true. When somebody says mm -hmm. something is your responsibility, that's not a physical mm -hmm. fact. That's their moral value system that they are telling you that you should yeah. also subscribe to this thought process that exists in their head and it's not an observable observable absolute reality so um you should challenge it question it but if agreeing to that responsibility helps you do what you want to do be who you want to be or feel at peace then 
great. Adopt that responsibility because you like the way it affects your actions. But never thinking that it's absolutely uh, an absolute reality truth. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I have to ask, romantic relationships, overrated, underrated? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you are. For some people, it is their entire reason for living. And if that works for them, if if they have the deepest meaning in their life by what they give to their partner and get from their partner and grow and all that kind of stuff, um, great, if that works for you. Um, I spent 35 years of my life finding and minding relationships and i have just recently in the last 20 months been extremely invigorated and flourishing because i am not doing that it feels great to not have and not want a romantic relationship i love it so much so um yeah, but then maybe that's because of my previous 35 years. I don't know. Maybe. Or because it gives you so much time for yourself to do, create, to do the work that you find yeah. play. Which, yeah. yeah. And it's and it's also my situation where I have a 12-year-old boy who is my right. best friend. Mm. And we are very close. Mm. And I yeah. put basically all of my non-working time into him. I give him my full attention and it's very rewarding for both of us. So maybe that's uh, cool. all I can do right now. Yeah. Let me ask you, what is something that you feel is overrated? Hmm. Oh, it depends on the person. Sorry, dude. I mm -hmm. wish I could have a, like a snappy answer for you, but it's so, like, I know too wide of a variety of people. Any, any word I could say now would be the opposite right here. So... Sorry. Uh -huh. um, but is there something? And <laughs> you can elaborate. You can elaborate on it, right? It doesn't have to be the truth for everyone, but just to hear your thought process and insights into why you feel it might be overrated. <laughs> I love it. You're kind of like, hey, sing us a song. I'm like, well, I don't really have a song to sing. You're like, oh, that's all right. Sing us a song anyway. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not forcing just, you, by the way, if you... I'm going to pick a good one from two years ago then. Um, uh -huh. Consistency. I had been underrating consistency because maybe I was so focused on personal growth and exploration. Uh, I met somebody uh, romantically two years ago that said that her most important value was consistency. And that bowled me over. I went, whoa, consistency. Like, of all of the things in life, I'd never tried that. I've never tried consistency. So that was really interesting. For two years, we, we were together for two years, and um, for those two years, I was very consistent for her because she told me that's what she valued. And I'd never considered that before. It was all the way underrated for me. It was zero rated. And to bring that up to a level of importance felt really new and interesting to me. Because I think I had learned from maybe watching too many uh, dramas in my teen years that to be tempestuous and unpredictable and wild and, you know, dramatic was a good thing. Well, in fact, it just makes for good uh, drama, <laughs> which makes for good, you know, uh, keeping people glued to watch advertisements uh, in between commercial breaks, um, but is not the best in an actual real romantic relationship. So that was a new idea to me. So there. Yeah, consistency might sound boring in a way, right? But it's actually right. very stable and... Uh... That's not bad, actually, it can, at all. <laughs> it can give a great foundation of security in a relationship. Yeah, totally. So that you can flourish in other ways. Yeah. 
Um, let me also ask then, what is something that you feel is overrated? Status. I would like to understand why Chinese culture is so focused on status, why that's like the ultimate value or the primary importance. Because to me, I can't relate. I, I don't get it. I don't understand why people would care so much what other people think. Um, yeah. You do, you do your job. You do it well. Um, you're great at what you do. You give objective observable results and value to others through your actions. What does it matter what somebody thinks of you? And, and isn't status in your own swagger and your own confidence, let's say, not a thing that you could buy? Any idiot can buy a thing. Uh, how does how is buying a thing give anybody status? Um, I don't get that at all. Yeah. Well, it shows, I guess, if you buy something expensive that you have money and that's quite, um, yeah. But it doesn't even show that. Sh it shows that you put something on your credit card. Right. A, mm -hmm. a lot of people... But on the outside, yeah. on the outside to then, people, it shows that you have a fancy car, so you must have a lot of money, maybe. Yeah, but you'd think that people would see through that. And also realize you would that think. <laughs> some of the most miserable, awful, despicable, disgusting, terrible people on earth yep. have bought expensive things. It, it should say nothing of a person's status. And even then, I love um, this idea that nobody looks at a person in an expensive car and says, wow, what a cool person. At best, what people say is, wow, I wish I had that car. Like, really, nobody's thinking about you. Nobody cares about you. <laughs> to me, that's so liberating to know this. Like, really, no, ultimately, nobody cares about you. Everybody just cares about themselves. So why would I do a single damn thing to mm -hmm. be thought of better by others? It's the most irrational thing to do. Yeah. I guess because it gives you options where money is valued or status is valued so high in societies like in the Western world or in China, it gives you options and that improves your survival rate. If Maybe, you go yeah. All the way down to that. <laughs> yeah. um, See, I, I like that you're arguing against that. And I, I'd, like to, uh -huh. I'd like to dive deeper into understanding that mindset. It's a super important, uh, super interesting topic. Absolutely, yeah. But UK, so you would say that's overrated status for me yeah mm -hmm. yep okay all right i have the dessert for you derek <laughs> are you ready for it sure <laughs> so um as the dessert i want to talk i have a question about death uh in my relatively young life i've been confronted a lot with death uh, I've lost my dad when I was like four years old. I uh, have been diagnosed with life-threatening heart disease when I was six years old. I struggled for years with suicidal thoughts when I was a teenager. Uh, and uh, about three years ago, uh, maybe you don't know it, but it's uh, I survived a sudden cardiac arrest. So it's also called a uh, sudden death where my heart just stopped when I was asleep. Uh, through a chain of luck, I survived that because you got to be just so lucky. Uh, so I've thought a lot about this topic. I find it a very interesting topic. I don't mean with that that I have the answers about it, but I've just I've thought about it a lot in my life. As the thinker that you are, I also wanted to hear your thoughts on this topic. How do you feel about that? And uh, what, over these years of being alive, um, have you come to learn about death that had a profound impact on how you live today? Wow. By the way, that was probably the best setup for a question I've ever heard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it's nice. interesting now thinking about like how earlier you mm. were asking me about luck. And then, yeah, the sheer luck mm. of you making it through that uh, that night. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to frame this 
through the lens of useful, not true beliefs. Not because I'm trying to sell a book, <laughs> but I already think that way. And the last two years, I've been very focused on thinking this way. So here we are in August 2024. You're going to get Derek's useful, not true lens on death, which is... Um, by the way, I'm not saying death is not true. <laughs> it is very much. But I'm saying that um, the how you look at it, a perspective on death isn't necessarily true. It's just one way of looking at it. Um, so I find it very encouraging. Uh, it works for me wonderfully to keep death right outside my door <laughs> to think that it is right on my tail and I've got to uh, be smart, be healthy to keep it away as long as possible. Um, yeah, yeah. I need to appreciate th the few moments I have now before it comes, before it catches me. Uh, I love this idea that a disabled woman said uh don't forget that we are all temporarily abled and yeah, she explained that by saying yeah, that like yeah. eventually every single one of us is going to become disabled oh no she said unless you you die a sudden shocking death in your perfect health almost every one of us will become disabled in some way whether it's um mentally disabled with dementia, physically disabled with your joints and arthritis, not able to do the things you used to be able to do. So you should, so let's just appreciate that we are all temporarily abled. And that thought to me makes me go, ooh, that gets me out the door running. That gets me lifting weights. Uh, that worked for me in a way that other ideas don't. Uh, same thing with death, to think, um, I'm assuming now, that I'm in the final quarter of my life. Uh, I'm 54, and I do have an inherited DNA thing that makes me like way more likely to get cancer. And I've actually had uh, cancer like four times in the last four years. And really, so I'm not yet. Yeah, so I'm not going to assume that I'm in the better half of the statistics. Like, oh, you know, most people die at 72, but I'm going to be 100. No, I'm just assuming that the statistics apply to me. And in fact, I might be on the bottom half of those. So I'm assuming that I'm in the last quarter of my life right now. And this belief really works for me. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. Who will? <laughs> I'll never know <laughs> until it's too late. But I'm going to assume that I'm in the final quarter because that... Uh, beats procrastination that stops procrastination that makes me do things now if i say that i want to do them someday it's like well don't have many some days left this is it got to do it now yeah uh and those things that i might be putting on to a list of like ooh, i really want to i don't know learn to become fluent in hungarian <laughs> or play drums or something like that i can say well don't have much time left, so what's it going to be? Am I going to actually do this now, or am I going to take this off my list? And so for a lot of things, I get to just take them off my list. I'm like, you know what? That's not going to happen, and that's all right. Uh, so that's how I think about death, and that's how it's worked for me. For anybody listening to this, I'm not suggesting you adopt my way of thinking about it, but you should ask yourself what way of thinking about it works for you which way of thinking about death makes you take the actions that you would like to take or feel more at peace yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean um death can be a, a super powerful source to do stuff with uh, because of rights so uh it sets a deadline and i mean it is a deadline right uh but using that, yeah, uh, that can be super powerful. Wait, uh, by the way, so I'm, wait, now I'm just so, curious because I never thought about that word "deadline" before. Is the literal uh -huh. Dutch what is the literal Dutch translation of "deadline"? Is it the same? 
Uh, deadline. Uh, ooh, whoa. We, we use that word all the time in Dutch too. Uh, that I'm completely blanking now on what we say. But I don't think we say it like that. Um, okay. No, I don't think we say it like that. Wait, that's... I, I love... Why? That's so fun to get into etymology sometimes. Where you, you uh -huh. learn, say, like the Chinese word for something, and you go, ooh, that's interesting. So wait, your word for this is that? Oh, wow, what an interesting way to think about that. It, it's, so yeah, you just suddenly said deadline when talking about death, and I went, oh, wow, I never thought about that. Deadline. You cross this line, you die. This is when you die. That's the mm, deadline. That's even oh. deeper than I <laughs> imagined. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Hold on, you said that you had cancer before. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's fine. They, there are some chunks cut out of me in four different places. Um, and, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, all right, that's the... Actually, I will add one thing that I, I mean, this is something that I feel after that experience of my sudden uh, death, my cardiac arrest. Every day that I go to bed, you know, before I'm like <laughs> closing my eyes because it happened in my sleep, right? I'm right. always like, all right, am I going to wake up tomorrow? <laughs> wow. And it's not with like with fear or, or something, yeah. right? But it's more like a, uh, it's a strange feeling maybe to exactly put in words. Uh, I have an ICD in me, so the chat, like, which is an internal defibrillator, so it mm -hmm. will give me a shock if it would happen. But still... Uh, I have that feeling very strongly. And then if I wake up the next day, I'm actually very excited. I'm like very grateful. I'm like, holy fuck, I woke up. <laughs> uh, so, wow. and this so far over the last three years has happened almost every day, uh, wow. which I actually like in a way. It makes yeah. me, I guess, way more grateful to still have a second chance at life. So, yeah. Dude, have you ever shown <laughs> your scar on camera? Oh, now on a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> you should do it. Show it. I've seen yeah. it before. Can you? Can you? Like, I haven't seen yours, but I've seen oh, yeah? others. Can you show? Because it's really I... badass. Yeah. Let me just see, because I can't completely see myself right now. So you see the yeah. ICD here, right? And then yes. the scar is. Uh, can you see that? It's yeah. maybe with the lighting that's not so good. Yeah, you can see. Now you um, can see the outline. It's like a rectangle, right? You see the corner of it. Yeah. Under the skin. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a little box. Yeah, wow. they made me in a, in a cyborg. <laughs> yeah. All right, Derek, that was the uh, last question that I had for you. I have one final... Go on. I, bet, Sorry? I, I just got an extra dessert out of you. That was cool. To, like show pe Most people have never seen one of those. I've seen one before, but that's really cool to see. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I got a little bit negative Any, here for everyone. Who's anybody just listening, listening, you're gonna have to go search to this uh, one hour mark in the YouTube and or one hour and yeah. twelve minutes yeah. into this uh, on YouTube and find that. Uh, um, exactly. I got one end question that I ask all my guests that I like to ask you as well. Uh, but before I do that, what's the best place uh, for listeners to connect with you to check out your work? Where in general would you like to send people? Anybody listening to this should email me. I love meeting people around the world. I have an open inbox. I get emails from people every day. I love it. I like meeting people that have listened <laughs> an hour into a podcast like this. Um, I think it's really cool to meet those people. And then when I travel, I end up meeting up with those people in person. Um, so please, anybody listening to this, go to my website, sive.rs. And you must send me an email and say hello and introduce yourself. Cool. All right. So for everyone listening, uh, I'll put that in the show notes. Derek, the final end question that I have for you. Um, and you can make it super short. You can make, make it as extensive as you want. From everything that you've seen, experienced, lived and learned in your life, what's the one thing you know to be true? <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's always another way to look at anything Derek Sivers thank you so much for being here on the show yeah thank you so much for having me it was a really fun conversation 
All right, all right, that concludes this episode here with the one and only Derek Sivers. I really hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did talking to Derek. Uh, now, to find any of the resources that Derek mentions, um, such as his latest book, Useful Not True, uh, any other things that he mentioned, check out the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode or you can also go directly to the ipsproject.com slash podcast and search for Derek. With that, uh, thank you so much for joining me and Derek here in this interview. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and if you can take just a couple of seconds of your time to leave a rating and uh, or leave a review, that would really mean a lot to me. Uh, and would help me to have more incredible guests like Derek here on the show. So in that sense, you're also in a way helping yourself, right? To gain more of these uh, amazing insights from people like Derek. All right, with that, thank you again for being here. And I hope that I get the chance to welcome you again soon on another episode. Until then, this is your host, Elis Fass, signing off. Bye. Oh, one last thing. If you want to learn even more from uh, guests, you know, that I had on the show here, want to spend some one-on-one time with them, then check out the IPS Academy uh, by going to the ipsproject.com slash academy or check the uh, description. I will also place the link there as that's where I have an archive of online courses that I created together with guests that have been here on the show. The courses are on the topics that we cover here on the podcast and that this, pro this, well, this platform, the IPS project has been created for to provide life education. The things that you don't learn on school, I want to bring here on this project. There's courses around mental health, relationships, the body and brain, the mind. Um, yeah, go through the list and see what you might find interesting. Uh, check the description to find the link or go directly to the ipsproject.com slash academy to find the same page. All right, that's all now. See you next time. Bye.